is the creator economy and why should you care? And how does it intersect with other buzzy new technologies like cryptocurrency, blockchain, and NFTs? If you know nothing about these things but their names, you're not alone. For all of the hype, only 1% of internet users have had anything to do with cryptocurrency and NFTs. But that's set to change. And that's why we're excited to be talking today with Peter Lieb, the co-founder of Cairo Digital. Today, Peter's going to tell us why the future of crypto is not all about art and money, but utility. Think memberships, ownership, and access. We all love access. And above all, brand value. It may just be the currency that connects the advertisers of the future with the creators of today. So let's find out what crypto, blockchain, and NFTs are and why they matter more than you think on this episode of Everything is Better with Creators. Everything is Better with Creators, the podcast that takes a deep dive into all things creator economy. Produced and presented by Whaler. Whaler, we power the creator economy. With your hosts, Ashley Rudder, Emma Harmon, Jamie Goodfriend, and Marco Batozzi. everyone. Welcome to Everything is Better with Creators. I'm Jamie Goodfriend, your guide to all things happening in the creator economy. Every week, myself or my colleagues, Marco Bertozzi, Emma Harmon, or Ashley Rudder will be hosting this podcast. Coming up, we're getting right into this episode with our big interview. So if you want to understand how crypto, Bitcoin, and NFTs connect to the creator economy, you're in for an interesting session with Peter Lieb as he talks us through Cairo Digital. Just a reminder that Everything is Better with Creators is brought to you by Whaler. The Whaler Way combines tech, talent, and creative social strategy to match brands with creators and produce authentic content that people really want to see. Whaler is democratizing the creative process for brands and creators by empowering a global talent network of thousands of influencers tastemakers, creatives, and storytellers to connect with your target audience, making advertising more inclusive, diverse, and effective. Check out more at Whaler. That's W-H-A-L-A-R dot com. And now it's time to bring up the headliner of the evening. Very special. Please welcome to the stage. The Big Interview. Everything is better with creators. Well, good morning, Peter Lieb. Thrilled to have you on today. Thanks for having me. This is this is good. I, when I posted that I was doing a podcast on LinkedIn, you said you'd be on, but you didn't want me to. You you made me promise that I wouldn't make you cry. So I I may try to interview you so in depth that you cry. It would be a first on our on our podcast. So let's see if I can get there. Mm-hmm. You know, anything you're doing these days has to be interesting. So um, I'm excited to talk. I'm obviously a fan of Whaler as well. So it's a, it's a nice intersection of just so much craziness that's going on in the space these days. Oh, my God. Well, this is the funny thing. So I think I got to get a T-shirt that says crypto, metaverse, NFTs, creator economy. I don't know. Add another one. It, because whenever I'm out and about, there's either great fascination and intellectual curiosity or a lot of derision and oh my god seriously you're going to talk crypto and bitcoin and blockchain and i think it's really a sign of the times that there are two camps so i'm excited to have you be our expert and help break this down uh, before we get started i want to really make sure we set up your background uh you started in advertising crazy enough and you went into, you're shaking your head. I know it's really frightening. Just so, um, just so then, long ago, but so much of it's applicable even to this day. Like even at these Web3 projects, when I think about it, like I almost think we're at a state now where it comes down more to the marketing and advertising and storytelling than it does the actual technology. So it's so interesting, right? Like, I mean, I haven't touched the true advertising space in 15, 20 years, but it's, it's almost coming full circle again. 
Oh, it's totally coming full circle. So, well, actually, I'll, I'll come back to your background at Fox because I think that's really um, important. Uh, but what you just said is a really good jumping off point because I think where we are right now, for those of us who are old enough to have gone through it, is web was what in the early days of Web One because people forget that in all of this craziness with the innovation and creativity happening right now, what we're really talking about is a set of disparate tools and capabilities that everyone's trying to figure out. And it reminds me of the early days of the internet when you had dial up and it was Earthlink and there was a program called Fetch and there were no browsers. And I think it, you tell me, is it fair to say that we're at that stage right now, pre Netscape, pre Internet Explorer, pre Google, where people are still, it's technologically confusing. So there's still a lot of talk about the technology versus the utility. And, it, and I think that's where Cairo comes in. Yeah, it's where we come in. And it's kind of a problem um, we've been trying to solve actually for a couple of years and then more formalized it in the last year with. Um, with Cairo, but I think it's this interesting, a little bit of a double-edged sword, right? Everyone talks about the dial-up era because of the infrastructure and the technology, but there's incredible technology and incredible tools and incredible systems. I think we're one of them um, that's been building to make it easier, but consumers aren't going to care about any of that stuff, right? It's always, it's just like, how does the website get powered? No, no one talks about the underlying infrastructure of the internet anymore. It's simply all about the application, which is the website, the store, the mobile app, right, that you're using as a, on a consumer level. And so there's plenty of technology. Is it complicated? Yes. Could we all collectively make it easier? Yes. But we're also rebuilding an entire infrastructure that took 20, 25 years to, to build and to get us to this point right now. So it, it is an interesting, I think, dichotomy of what's going on. But at the same time, People are, getting, are deploying more applications every single day. Creativity is starting to come out more and more, regardless of people's feelings about decentralization and business models and ownership. Like the types of projects we see and that I see just in a day-to-day -day life, they're amazing. I wish I could think of them creatively right now, right? Like right. I, we're going to get into, we're starting already to get into a world of more applications, more use cases, more ideas, things that work, things that have failed. And if we're all doing this in six to nine months, what's going to happen in 10 years from now? I'm so excited to talk to you, Peter, about your new company, Cairo. Can you tell us what it does and what you're doing? You've got a great start. Yeah. So Cairo is the first Web3 native platform built. And what that ultimately means is we're trying to abstract all the technical complexities um, for the marketplace to allow them to more easily build and deploy marketplaces themselves and to think about more of the underlying creativity and business models and utility of their projects versus having to worry about how do I build any of this myself, which they shouldn't do. How do I build any of this for a, in a cost efficient way, which has not been proven out in the marketplace before. And so the platform is uh, a no custom code platform that partners can easily build and deploy these marketplaces literally in minutes right now. Is that like, that's, maybe this is a bad analogy. Is it a Squarespace or Spotify for Web3? It's, it's a bit of Shopify meets Stripe um, with with a lot of nuances to the whole thing but it enables the building so let's think of the way consumers see going to a website or a storefront right and shopify has obviously been the best at it and has an incredible third-party application side right that enables their storefronts to just iterate and build a better experience for, for customers but it also has the underlying engine of transactions in crypto are difficult payments are difficult Moving money around is difficult. There's many blockchains that people can build on. We've enabled many of them already. So it, it brings a lot of learnings, I think, from the web to, let's call it e-com side of things. Uh, it makes it more applicable in today and tomorrow's world of blockchain. So I'm talk to me like I'm a five-year-old. Tell me what's a use case. I'm excited about web three. I'm excited about blockchain. I, I've... I'm challenged by the 
technological complexity, how am I using Cairo? Yeah, so if you have any idea, let's make it the most simple thing you can do, which is I'm dropping NFTs to my fans. How are you going to do that today? You're going to typically find an engineer, a developer, a group. You're going to pay them a decent amount of money, and they're going to launch something very basic that, honestly, you're not going to be able to manage tomorrow. So with us, we've abstracted all of the technical complexities with building. We made it so easy for people to actually plug and play into the system and to deploy it on their own domain, owning it themselves. We're just the technology behind the scenes that's powering it all. So everything from how your assets get displayed to how the transactions are happening to what more do you want within the NFT than a digital certificate? What more can it open? So we've built an entire utility application layer, which basically says, if you own A, therefore you get B. And so we believe a lot of these, uh, these assets, which are truly assets, are going to have all types of rights that customers, IP owners are going to build into it. Is it merchandise driven? Is it content driven? Is it physical driven as an experience? Is it virtually driven? Is it inside of a metaverse, which is a whole probably other conversation? Um, is it not? And I don't believe any of this stuff is, is an or, it's more of an and. Uh, and I think it also is starting to lead us from a lot of our customers today into a kind of a loyalty CRM 3.0, right? If you know so much more now about your customer and they're holding your asset, what more can you do with them? And I think it opens up many, many use cases no one's talking about. I love giving these analogies. That that definitely shows your background in the entertainment business. You were at Fox for a long time, so I think your log line of Spotify meets Stripe is is really helpful. That feels very um, polished from the from your Hollywood storytelling days. Uh, tell me, so I mean, I saw this crazy stat that there's forty one billion dollars in the crypto world. Is that correct? And yet one percent, less than one percent of online consumers are participating. Is that crypto or is that, how, how would you define that $41 billion? Uh, yeah, it's all crypto assets, whether it's to me, the NFTs, coins, tokens, it's, it's the overall pool. I've seen the estimates at the less than 1% of online consumers. I've seen it at the 1% to 4%. I think everyone's trying to figure out and size up the marketplace a little bit more, but it's driven off of early adopters and evangelists, no different than any other era. I mean, how many of us in Web2 in the, in the social network era, how many people were, you know, on Reddit early on or using Snap, which is completely different, you know, 10 years ago or however long um, it started versus today. And by the way, how different do those platforms look when they first started? And they got, right, the early evangelists, the developers, the insiders to play around with it and start building on top of it versus mainstream adoption today. So. I think everyone's grappling towards what to do, but I also think everyone needs to start understanding their direct audiences and what they actually care about more, right? You see a lot of projects, you know, early on that were, you know, like the cash grabs, the pump and dumps, the I'm just going to do it to do it. But each of these audiences, whether it's creator driven or brand driven or community driven, like they're just so vastly different to me than the next that I'm trying to make it easier to just build something for the creative world, but let them think about what they actually want to build. Let them think about how it actually relates to their business today, because many of them have great businesses, right? So the logical question is, why do I even need this? And I don't think you do for many of them. Right. It, unless you're, it, I can only imagine, and I hear a lot of the conversations in the marketing departments, where's my NFT? What's my TikTok yeah. strategy as opposed to what do my audiences want? What's best for my brand in these new places? And then how do we super serve them based on what makes sense? So you said a second ago, really great way of looking at it. It's there's, there's the brand world, there's the creator world, and there's the artistic world. I think it's, I think it's almost... I think it's almost all worlds, but I, but I also think that's why it's interesting, right? Everything has to start somewhere. And so the idea of, con let's call it the consumer crypto side started in, in the uh, art industry. 
because it's a challenged market. Like there were, there were, you know, there are fundamental business model challenges that so many artists face, right? And I think them having this new business model, which is truly what the blockchain has enabled, has allowed artists to think differently about, you know, how to distribute, how to sell, how to market their art without an intermediary. I think we're now slowly starting to see the music side, which again, not a deep history in music, but I can understand all the challenges that artists face, especially on an independent level where they're thinking to themselves, how do I stay afloat, right? right. How, do I, how do I go back to the world of the true thousand or maybe in their case, 500 fans? And on a consumer level, I always think about, you know, growing up in Los Angeles and going to the Troubadour and seeing a band that no one's ever heard about and saying to myself, this band is amazing. Like, I hope it works out for them because then they'll make more music. And then telling 10 of my friends how incredible this band is that they've never heard about. For consumers to now participate in both the financial and social upside of that idea, I think it's a it's a win win for fans and it's a you know it's a win for artists. So it's the futures market for talent, I guess is maybe how you look at it. Yeah. Putting a the futures market exactly for for a lot of talent and again for other talent, they don't need it and it doesn't work right. It's it's just it's offering, you know, a lot of tools, ideas, and infrastructure, you know, to make them think about things differently, to make them think of their business model differently, and I think it's the same way. You know, for creators, and you've seen less creators for many reasons I'm sure we can get into, maybe some dabbling, maybe some just have, have no interest, but, you know, it's a lot of the reason why I think, you know, creator five, five or six years ago now when I got into the creator space, that they all really started thinking about diversification, right? They couldn't rely on singular platforms. They needed to rely on the notion of the true thousand fans. And with that, you had the emergence of you know, a lot of different SaaS companies that offered individual services. Um, and now we're just at that next era where, you know, business models could completely change for them again in, in the best possible way and make them, you know, more of a long-term asset. We talked to a lot of brands. Help me unpack the basic thought process that would, in your opinion, be helpful for a marketer to consider as they're looking at this space. Take out the jargon, take out the hype. You talked about CRM. You talked about knowing your audience. What is the utility? What's the process? How does somebody evaluate getting into the whole web three of it all as a brand? Yeah, so I think the logical step is everyone's gone from, I'm going to partner with an artist and I'm gonna create a unique asset right? That speaks to a subsector of my audience and I'm going to see how it goes. And I am so supportive of everything anyone does to test this stuff out right now. Cause again, I really believe every audience is vastly different from the next. I think for, for brands right now, it's got to be thought of as that loyalty program of the future, meaning the ownership of the asset should unlock many things of value to them. Value could be in the form of my old days of the Catalina coupon, right, in store. Like it could be value now that's instantly dropped to them in a wallet that relates to a discount on a product. It could relate to them being a loyal customer and you can see it because you can see into their wallet and saying to them, they now get that you know, I always go back to Pepsi's, you know, cultural side, right? The money can't buy experiences, the Super Bowl, the concert that CPG companies throw, right? And so we've now started digitizing a lot of these loyalty programs. I almost imagine like, you know, the early days of uh, my Coke rewards. Haven't kept up with it by any means, but what could Coke do if the my Coke reward was now living on chain and was transparent? And you can understand the information more, right? And you can start having that dialogue um, in a very digitized way. What more creatively could you do? How does the world of collectibles, right, work the same way? So I think you got to understand the general foundation. And obviously, brands have incredible agencies, right, that just are focused on a lot of this stuff and are diving in right now. But you do have to understand the 
basic foundation. You don't need to understand all the technology, right? There's a lot of partners for brands. But I think that should fuel a lot of the creativity that we're not quite seeing today that everybody's trying to figure out. That's a really great simplification in a way that I think will give people an access point that is logical. Web3 is modern loyalty. I think it can facilitate it. That's a great that's a great way of looking at it and it's funny cuz I spent some time at Wonderman years ago and Lester Wonderman is the father of direct marketing and that insight created a whole crazy industry of whether it's I'm going to address a piece of mail to dear homeowner versus dear Peter the open rate is so much higher when it's dear Peter and I think the industry has been working so hard since the 40s or 50s to deliver on that promise of what we always hear this phrase is personalization at scale. And this is truly personalization and value at scale that you can monitor. And I do love the idea of thinking about my Coke rewards and how you would manage it with on the blockchain. I mean, we all have our mileage programs, which are challenging on all the airlines. I have my Amex points. God only knows. And all of that stuff is all over the place. And, and I think that's a really interesting um, analogy. The, so if we, we take that idea of brand using Web3 as a modern loyalty channel or approach, it does open up a lot of creativity. But then you got into wallets. And yeah. that is the mystery in my mind of where brands are not thinking to me, it's all about the wallet. And I find it fascinating that that's not the lead conversation. I don't know where Cairo is with wallets, but if you can unpack the importance wow. of wallets, I think for brands, that's that's the real estate that is the untapped gold mine. Yeah, I really, we've been thinking a lot about it. So uh, one of our, my partners on um, in the company comes from early days at Apple. With, with Steve, with John Scully, and that whole team launched launched uh, Lisa, which turned into Macintosh, which launched you know the App Store and everything. So while we're a B two B company, it's truly with the lens of the B two B to C of it all. And the more you start stripping everything back right now, the wallet is the fundamental differentiator between let's call it Web two, Web two point five, and Web three right now. I think we're going to see a lot more of these experiences looking like what we're all used to as consumers, which is one click, simplicity, lack of drop off, right? The consumer flow to a lot of these store, you know, web three storefronts. But at the end of the day, the wallet truly provides two things. One, it provides your social identity, which I think for a subsector of these audiences is really important, right? We've seen the move um, with Twitter Right, of changing your profile pictures into your PFP. I think social identity, digital identity is going to continue to grow. Uh, we've seen the community, right, the, the uh, Board Ape and, and, and a lot of successful PFP projects emerge from there. Um, but ultimately, the wallet also provides, you know, which is a tough thing for people to understand, but the liquidity for, for you, the owner of it all. Wait, pause right there for a second. Wh Okay, so let's let's even back up further because I, I use the word wallet and it was it took me a little while to understand until I actually created a wallet. But everybody actually who has an iPhone has an Apple wallet. You stick your you stick your boarding passes in there on a simplistic basis. That's a wallet. It's real estate on your phone. Am I missing something more complicated than that? Because I don't understand why that's not a bigger conversation of if I was on the brand side still right now, I'd be trying to fight my way in to get into every person's wallet that I possibly could. It's like the Starbucks card. Absolutely. I think there's two things. I think, you know, Apple or other large companies are, are going to enter the space to some degree, right? We're, we're slowly seeing it, you know, every 30 days, right? Everyone's figuring out their, their pathway in. So, you know, what, once they do or somebody else, I think you'll have a larger, a larger pool and audience and floodgates. But the the word 
The word Web3 to me is a loaded term these days, right? Because it can mean every single thing we're talking about right now. It can mean metaverse. I don't quite frankly understand how Web3 and metaverse got lumped together. It could mean uh, DeFi, which we do not need to get into for this audience, right? It could mean NFTs. Like it, it has a lot of meanings. The wallet is also another kind of misnomer to me a lot of the time, right? It's just where things, where things are held. And I think the marketplaces, especially in the IP entertainment world right now, they're, they're not Web3 wallets, right? They're making it easier on the customer. It's built within the existing marketplace, and it's just a place to store your assets. As we continue to grow into a world where only Jamie will be seeing her wallet and controlling her wallet, and no one else can touch it, the possibilities become almost endless of what you could do with it, right? How do you take your United airline miles, should United, right, start moving things into a, into a blockchain world? And how do you leverage your United miles beyond what's being offered today? Because of your wallet. Like, possibilities are endless along yeah, the way. So tie this in. So now we've gone from, okay, so we'll forget Web3 as a, as a collectible. I mean, as a collection of stuff. So this whole new space, this brave new world of loyalty. We'll just call it that yep. for that moment. Okay, so we've now defined that I'm a brand. I want to have a, pers a personal relationship with someone that does business with me. I now have access to their wallet. What are the experiences that make sense? Well, I think, again, I think there's a couple things of where it makes sense. One is... Brands are just going to use it on a marketing level. I really believe, right? They, they don't need to enter the world of uh, this asset inside of your wallet labeled brand X has liquidity over here to the right side, right? They're just going to use it as a digital ticketing mechanism. They're going to use it as a reward-based gamification play, right? Collect all 10 of these NFTs, therefore you get X, right? They're going to use it in that way. Now, I think the industry, in terms of just the analytics of it all, like we're not even close. To be able to pull information, you've got to be an engineer at heart. Like you have to truly understand this stuff, right? We don't have the simple dashboard world. We, uh, we sit around a room, a C-suite meeting, and look at you know our very basic metrics across our campaign right now. Like this is so complicated right now for everyone. But it's being treated to me as exactly the airline question, which is your miles, your rewards, your points, what did you get with them? And you can literally build any new model of anything you want about what these points and what these systems give you as a consumer, which is why I just think more and more of these use cases are going to pour out on a daily basis. I love it. But I think it's really great to simplify it and say this space is really about loyalty and about extending your relationships, at least from the brand perspective. Let's let's slip over to the creator side. Where, where are the implications for individual creators? And the part B of that question is, and how does that affect brands that are working with creators? Yeah, I think there's a, um, there's a place for both brands and creators, and there's a place for creators only, um, based on a lot of different ideas they have. I think today, the brand with the creator world related to Web3 has not surfaced at all, and I think it can easily can it can easily translate. Just like brands have played such an important part of the creator economy, and the creator part economy has played such an important part for many brands. It started with a lot of direct-to-consumer brands and it's now made its way to mainstream, um, call it you know, the Fortune 100 brands right now. So I think there's a world that needs to be looked at more as a long-term, I always go back to this, people talk about it and no one implements it, long-term community building partnerships. Not one-off influencer programs, which are wonderful and great and need to serve their purpose, but how do you actually build business models together to support and create value to these long-term communities in the world of Web3? So that's the first piece related to, I think, the world of brands and creators. Creators themselves, you know, 
People have dabbled in it. People are trying to digitize their memberships, right, on chain right now. And many of them don't know what to do. I think the majority of them from speaking with them and speaking with others don't quite know what to do. They're intrigued. They purchase crypto. They purchase NFTs. They have their own wallet. They're playing in the space. They're changing their profile pitch. But how it relates to their relationship between them being a content creator and their audiences, they have not quite figured out. And I think in part, thinking of it from their shoes, it's hard to change their business models that'll be, that are working for them. And many of them are small, medium-sized businesses that need every stream of revenue right now in order to maintain their business and to just abruptly try and change their business model. I think it's a very tough thing that's going to take time and ideation and creativity around. And that's where I go back to, it's not right for a lot of them today. And that's okay. I love this idea of there's some blue ocean that you just identified uh, that if there's a brand that is pretty savvy in this space that understands the value and benefit of building a community approach with a creator, how could a brand think about this to come to a creator who are so, the creators that we work with every day are so brilliantly innovative. How could they help them? I mean, brands have infrastructure, right? So in a perfect world, if you weren't at Cairo and you were advising a brand on their creator strategy, what's a way of thinking about it that would help tap into this innovation and creative thinking? So I think there's a number of use cases. The one I go back to is on the incubation of product side. I think we're seeing more and more of it, right? We've seen um, the Emma Chamberlain and Chamberlain Coffee. We've seen Mr. Beast now and Feastables. We've seen a lot of, you know, their own brands that they launch as a creator and then they, it goes off and tries to build a brand of its own right now. I, I go back to a world now where could a brand and a creator, or by the way, a series of creators, which is the beauty to me of blockchain, come together with their community at heart to build the next brand for a, gen a generational brand where everybody has the same incentive from the beginning and everybody has ownership in this new intellectual property together. So it's no longer creator saying, I have a new brand I created here, audience X, buy it, enjoy it, tell me about it. It's no longer a brand in their R&D group incubating an idea and pushing out to the audience saying, here you go, here's something new. But it's three different walks of life coming together saying, we're truly building this idea together. We, the brand, have the infrastructure. I, the creator or, or multiple creators, have the audience and distribution, and I, the community, all come together and all have a say in the process and all have ownership in the underlying product. I think it's a really interesting dynamic they could do together with aligned incentives that's been enabled now with blockchain and technology. Okay, so let's unpack this a little bit because this is really fascinating to me. And it is a business approach, and it doesn't. It actually doesn't have to be an an entirely new sneaker or something huge. I think so. If you always start with, what does the community want and need? What for a community of people, and that's an important part of of the creator economy. If you have a community of people, I always like to use this one, and I don't know why. You've got a community of people that love paella. I. Right, they they live and breathe paella. I think it's because I won't offend anybody in the paella business. That's why I use this one. So it's international. There's recipes. There's ingredients. There's techniques. There's travel. All right, so you've got this paella loving community. You've got creators who are really invested in making the best paella, finding the best tools, and maybe there's a brand out there that is a spice company. Obviously, I'm making this yep. up. Are we saying now that those three groups could come together, the community is the R&D, 
The creator is the keeper of the community's trust and the glue holding all of this together. The brand is the distribution and finance and technical R&D. And all three entities work together to launch this new super paella spice. Yeah, and I think it, not to overcomplicate it, but I think you've just created the next paella brand with owners who are all mutually incentivized. And if you want to even take it a step further, anybody over time could buy into this paella brand. And like a stock. Who, like a stock. And people who maybe were the original community members as well say, you know what? I loved it, but I don't like paella anymore. And so blockchain now has enabled this marketplace to say, great, you don't want it anymore? Find somebody who does. And a new paella lover comes in because they love the product. They want to be their own evangelist. They want to have a little skin in the game like stock, right? And so they just buy that person's token and you have a new community member. It just enables a lot, just a lot of different thinking around how to leverage it. I think it's single mission driven right now. So if we take, not to get again more technical, um, and I won't use the technical terms, but there's been a community that's come together saying the US constitution should be owned by the people. And it's a singular mission enabled by blockchain. There's been another group that's come together that says, we should own a golf course because it's expensive to be a member of a good golf course. We're going to all come together for that single purpose of golf and being social, and we're going to buy a golf course. Or the next group that's come together successfully or not saying, we all love football. Let's go buy a football team. And so we've almost entered into, I call it the, the Kickstarter 3.0 era of Yes, you contribute. Yes, you support ideas and initiatives. But shouldn't you, the individual, also have a stake in what you're helping to develop? And that's the beauty of what blockchain has now been enabling. I can't imagine the legal department in that Paella Spice Company, how they would get around this. But from a pure marketing, it would be brilliant because the community would feel invested. I, we used to talk about, back in my previous life, we had this concept called venture consumer. And I hadn't yeah. really put this together, but the idea of a venture consumer is because people expect more from the brands that they support. It's not merely a transaction. It's a vote of confidence in the brand, the management, the social responsibility. They want to be treated like investors and they want information about the company Etc. And that was an idea and an insight, but the execution of it was much more challenging. The story I used to always remember was Steph Curry, for example, had a launched a fashion line, and a young girl said they didn't come in girls' shoe sizes. And she wrote a letter. He reached out to her. They created a shoe for girls that was accommodating to girls' sizes, and they launched that product. That was a few years ago. Uh, but now with blockchain, it's enabling that on a number of different levels. And it's really fascinating. The, the idea that P and G could tap into a community of young moms, young families, young people who are having their first kid, finding out what they need, they, which they already do in a focus group anyway, but it giving them a stake in the upside is and having a creator participate because that's the trust factor and double trust with blockchain. Incredible. Like I hadn't really thought about it that way. I love doing this because I get to learn something every time I talk to a guest. Now what's Cairo's role on that then? We want to be the enablers to power, to power everything, to let all the, let's call it the, I use the term the applications, but the consumer facing companies be the ones to ideate, to be creative, to be storytellers, to be marketers, to pull it, you know, to pull it all together on a, on a 
consumer level and then to have Cairo be the ones to, to power it and to manage the day to day on a technology level because it's extremely complicated, right? They shouldn't have to worry about all the things that, that the news is covering about crypto today, right? We're not going to be talking about half this stuff in, in a couple of years from now. So there needs to be technology engines that enable all of this because at the end of the day, we are dealing with hard dollars, right? And dollars are being moved every second of every day around the world in real time. Um, and there's complexities to a lot of the underlying infrastructure today. And that's what we've taken years to build. Um, and now we're deploying it. But, you know, it's, it's great hearing from, from brands. It's great hearing from all different types of IP owners, how they're thinking about things, because it just informs, you know, our product and our roadmap. And everything we're building is to help, you know, enable them and to help speed up their time to market. Um, without having to build it in-house, which I think is extremely expensive and cumbersome. And having been at a very large uh, corporate company, we, you know, they don't tend to move quickly. Uh, and, and they need partners. They need agency partners and they need technology partners to think about this right now and to see what's happening and to have these conversations and to expand the horizon of ideas right now. Because I go back to every community is different. Every scenario is going to be different and every business model is going to be different. And the more these examples start to come to market, the more marketers do what marketers do, right? Which, which is they ideate. What would you love to tell a CMO or a CEO in private about an opportunity or advice or guidance without having to worry that they would throw you out of the boardroom? Such a great thing. I, I go back to it simple, which is you got to start today. I, I think anyone that's not starting today and anyone that's not dipping their toe in the water and testing things, and there's so many ways to test in the space right now, is going to fundamentally be decades behind right now. Um, I think a lot of people need to start thinking of their teams um, in technology sense right now. You know, we, I'll, I'll always remember in social media, no one had a social media team, right? And then what happened, right? Everyone's, you know, that one person fought and fought and fought for that social media budget. And then it became, where does that social media budget fall? Is it digital? Is it marketing, right? And I mean, it, it was a decade, it continues to be a decade of challenges about how to internally structure teams right now. And I think the one thing I would say that I don't know if people are thinking about as well, because we're in the era of, just launch something, just go do it, just be the NFT team, is how much internally blockchain is going to impact the entire organization, short-term or long-term, how it's going to impact wallets, how it's going to impact finance, how it's going to impact IT, how it's going to impact loyalty, how it's going to impact the creative groups. Like We're just thinking of them in little bubbles, little pockets right now to just get the project out, to test the project but I believe it's gonna have a fundamental impact across the organization. Um, and to start now thinking about things and to start now figuring out where it actually lives and where the technology lives. Are the Accentures, the McKinsey's, the sales forces of the world, are, are they looking at org structure, do you think? Are they starting to look at this beyond these little individual bubbles. I haven't really heard anybody talking about it from an org perspective. And I still hear many, many senior executives poo-pooing this because of the complexity and because they feel this is just yet another tactic or novelty. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's both. Um, I've got to believe, I, I haven't either, but I've got to believe that major consultancies are all talking about it. I mean, I've seen enough of the discussions they have just around infrastructure right now. So I, I have to believe they're thinking about things. Maybe they're thinking of it from the lens of the financial side of the company and less about the marketing and consumer side of the company, right? Where to move money, how to move money. Um, I mean, there's, again, that's why Web3 to me is whoever actually coined, coined it, whether it's the venture side or not, it's encompassing of so many distinct businesses and opportunities right now um, that it means a lot of things to a lot of different people and it'll figure itself out like everything does. Like everything is. Well, it's like generations, right? 
it's millennials, then Gen Z, Gen Alpha, Gen C, Gen Connected, Gen COVID. I don't know. You get to pick all those things and, and make your mark. Uh, anything we're missing that you want to bring up, Peter? No, I think, I think we covered a lot of it. I think it's an extremely exciting time. Nothing's perfect, right? Like, I think everyone's got to go into things thinking that their projects are going to fail and what they're going to learn from it and what they're trying to achieve from all of it right now and to build their own individual pathways because I probably have repeated this multiple times, but these are all just fundamentally different groups and communities. I think of it through the lens of, you know, if people know Reddit, go into a subreddit and understand community one, it's completely different than community two, which is completely different than community three. And they're all in these communities for many reasons. Some of them in, in the world of web three are in it to make money. And they've figured out incredible ways to make money for themselves and to build a different business for themselves. Others are completely in it because it opens a new era of storytelling, right? We've now seen a couple examples in entertainment where they can't get their project funded, but they have a small enough community, right? That can help kickstart the project. And next thing you know, you've removed gatekeepers and they're building the project of their dreams with a group of people who believe in them. And then we've got the next path, which is I'm gonna just use it as a rewards program, right? Just collect 10 of these NFTs. I'm gonna make it into a game. And with that, you're gonna get a coupon or, you know, um, some sort of sweepstakes component to it, right? Those are three just fundamentally different tactics right now that's best for your own brand and group. That's super succinct. Is there a use case at Cairo or a project that you can share that you want to want people to know that you're working on? I think we're working, you know, we're working on two very distinct buckets. One is the powering of marketplaces because I think much of the marketplaces are, have been very manual if you're looking to build something, it's complicated, it costs a lot, and we've abstracted all of that out into a, into a SaaS platform um, that everyone can use, you can power, and think of us just completely behind the scenes, right? Consumers don't, don't really know about it. The second piece is because we have the underlying platform and this ability to begin to associate value to whether it's a coin or an NFT or a token that a partner generates, we're looking to leverage the platform to create more of our own case studies for the community, for, for the broader audience. So we will be coming out with um, community membership-like programs by partnering with communities and people around communities and making it truly like the next wave of membership, less about scarcity and more about accessibility and more about value to that community. So that's coming out with a lot of, I'll call it different verticals and partners in, in the next month or two, but it's exciting, but we're all prepared for failure. I'm prepared for failure. I'm prepared for success. We just all have to learn as a community right now and then adjust our ideas behind it. I love that. That's very brave and logical and inspiring. Got to learn. Didn't ride a bike and without Gotta falling. Learn. And now's the time because if, if the numbers continue to go the way they are, right, as an industry, you, you can always jump in, but you're not going to get the foundational understanding. You're not going to get the early days of what works and what doesn't work. Um, I've had my career based on that. I jumped into social and digital before most people cared, and it was an uphill battle. Um, same with the world going from physical to digital to digital distribution to where we are today in entertainment. We saw it with creators where everyone said, crazy, I don't need to you know, be involved in this ecosystem in this industry, right? And look what's happened in such a short amount of time. Like the creator economy has barely been around if we look at it as a media industry, right? Like we're not even thinking about things right still. So I'm always of the mindset, follow the consumer and, and test the waters. I love that. I always say follow anybody under the age of 13 and you'll see what the future is. Well, yeah, I'll just follow your kids and see where they are like inside of road, you know, inside of roadblocks and which, you know, which world they're building inside of and it'll give me an insight into the future. 
certainly will. Well, it's been a great education and inspiration, Peter Lee. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Jamie. Good to see you. We hope you've enjoyed what you've heard and will come along with us as we navigate this journey to the promised land of the creator economy. Make sure to subscribe or follow our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or wherever you like to listen to audio. And of course, we'd love a rating and review if you get the opportunity. Special thanks to Peter Lee for joining us today. Make sure to check out more from Whaler and all things at the intersection of talent, partnerships, technology, and creativity at whaler.com. Please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. For everything is better with creators, I'm Jamie Goodfriend. We'll catch you next time. with creators is produced by Whaler. Whaler, we power the creator economy. Learn more at whaler.com.